Good morning. Welcome to the fourth week of our series we've called Rebuilt. It's named after the book of the same name. That we've been sharing the principles and practices that have helped the rebuilding of many parishes throughout the United States and even some in Europe. We began by going back to see the very mission of the church, go and make disciples. We also noted that discipleship requires faith. Sometimes faith feels like existing in uncertainty. Sometimes faith means simply waiting for God to act. Last week, we tried to convince you that you need to get up out of your pew and start serving in a ministry or in one of our missions. The ministry is what we do here inside our congregation, and missions are what we do beyond our church community. But today, we're going to focus on who we're targeting as our prodigal son here at St. Peter. That in the Gospels, the parables are stories Jesus used to help us to see reality through God's eyes. Three parables that are in Luke chapter 15 are different versions of the same story. It goes like this. Something is lost. Something is found. The people involved celebrate. We're looking at the third parable that Jesus told, and probably the most famous of the three, the prodigal son. That Luke tells us about the context in which Jesus told his story. Jesus is teaching a huge crowd of people, most of whom weren't very religious. There's also a small crowd who were very religious. The not-so-very-religious people came to listen and to learn from Jesus. The so-very-religious people came to spy on him. The religious people thought that we get closer to God by separating ourselves from the non-religious people. But Jesus abruptly tosses that concept into the waste bin by telling them the story of the prodigal son. Man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. An absurd request met even by an even more absurd response. So the father divided the property between them. Just like that, the father gives the son what he asks for. And the son wastes no time enjoying it on a life of dissipation. Sounds interesting. A life of dissipation. Basically, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now remember, there are two distinct audiences to this story. The so very religious people are thinking, shocking how Jesus could even tell such a story. And the not-so-very-religious people who are thinking, wow, that's my story. Jesus goes on that the young man blew it all and ended up in a pigsty. Without getting too graphic, pigs are garbage disposals who may feed on the food and refuse the other animals won't eat. This is about as low as you can go. But then the story takes a sudden turn. That the young man decides to return to his father, not for forgiveness, but for food and a job. The parable continues, so he got up and went back to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with A, anger, how dare you come back? B, disappointment, I can't believe you've come back. C, revulsion, 
Get away from me. Don't ever come back. Or D, none of the above. The Father's heart is filled with compassion. We know that the answer is D, compassion. Then the Father just goes nutty and throws a big party. The not religious people are amazed. Is that how it works with God? And the so very religious people are like, that's not how it works. Where is the fire and the brimstone? That's why Jesus adds this last part to the story. The older son. The older son represents the very religious people. And the older son hears about this and he becomes angry. And he basically lays out his case as to why he shouldn't have to share his inheritance with his brother again. In other words, it's not fair. And it really isn't fair by any human logic. But the father says, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The father wants his kids home. All of them. And if you're a parent, you understand that. And they don't even have to do anything to earn it or to deserve it. Even if they mess up big time, he wants them home. It's not fair. And it's actually more unfair than it seems at first glance. Not only is God so unfair as to want the not-so-very-religious people home, he's so unfair, he wants the so-very-religious people to go out and to get the not-so-very-religious and invite them home and share their inheritance with them. Think about it. The very last thing we would ever want God to be is fair. A couple of years ago, we made an important decision here at St. Peter. That we were going to change our primary focus from the people in the pews to the people who aren't in the pews. We determined that the efforts of our parish would be outwardly focused. We began to focus on the prodigal sons here in Jupiter. The people who weren't coming to church anymore. What do they look like? Who are they? What do they like and what are they like? We took a cue from the book, rebuilt, and named our prodigal son Jupiter Joe. You can call her Jane also. Just figured that if we could get Joe to come, that Jane already knows that they need to be here. So we're focusing on Jupiter Joe. Just that we've done a lot of homework on how to get Joe to want to come back. That he might be a fallen away Catholic or may have never walked into a church before at all. So what can all of us do to make Joe want to walk in here. That it's simple. One is to make the weekend interesting and accessible from his perspective. Also to ask all of us, this requires a group effort here, to get involved by investing in the Joes that they know and inviting them to church. Invest and invite is our basic strategy. You know what they call that? Evangelization. Now, as we become an evangelizing parish, we also made an interesting and amazing discovery that we ourselves were growing as disciples because of it. And as we help make church matter to Jupiter Joe, it matters more all of us.